Welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Norman Solomon is an American journalist, an activist, a media critic, and the co-founder and national coordinator of RootsAction.org. He's the author of War Made Easy and is a longtime associate of fear, fairness, and accuracy in reporting. His new book, War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine, is a must read. Every single person that has read this book thus far finds it a must read, especially in these militaristic times that we are here in the United States of America. Welcome to Politics Done Right, Norman Solomon. Thanks so much. Look, it's my pleasure to have you as usual. You know, there's one part of uh, uh, where, where you mentioned when you give the indication that people are, some people seem to be expendable. I'm originally from Central America, Panama. And I remember, I remember when uh, Bush number one invaded Panama. And uh, when I think it was Colin Powell, they asked about the number of Panamanians that got killed. And the statement, I think it was out of his mouth or one of his protégés mouth was collateral damage. And just when I read the title of your book, that is the first thing that came to mind. People as collateral damage. Why did you write this book? I wrote it really much because of the point that you're raising here, that in the U.S. media and politics, whether it's acknowledged directly or not, some people are expendable and some people aren't. And a couple of years after that invasion of Panama, when the United States killed, according to the Pentagon, about 100,000 Iraqi people in six weeks, Time magazine gave a definition of collateral damage. According to this magazine, which was the main news magazine of the United States, collateral damage referred to people who should have chosen, and I'm quoting here, should have chosen a different neighborhood. Now, this is the kind of arrogance that we're dealing with. And in the 1980s, we had the effort of the United States of America from the White House to overcome what it often described out of the Oval Office as something bad that had taken place. It was called the Vietnam Syndrome because according to the, the military authorities and the presidents, this was a bad thing. People after the Vietnam War in the United States, some of them, many were very hesitant or even opposed to the US intervening. So during the 80s, we had, of course, the invasion of Grenada, then the invasion of Panama, and that was a run-up. This was, okay, we're getting back into it, so we will crush these two small countries, and then we'll go on, have bigger fish to fry in terms of militarism. So the Gulf War in 1991, then the U.S.-led bombing of Serbia and Kosovo in 1999, 78 straight days of bombing, not a single American lost, which is another way that good U.S. wars are defined. And then after 9-11, going ahead to invade Afghanistan and Iraq. And so I wrote this book to bring up to the surface something that is so routinely evaded many points on this spectrum that are not addressed. One is that the United States media and politics, with rare exceptions, tacitly or explicitly divides the planet into two parts, those who count and those who don't, those who suffer whose grief matters and those whose grief does not matter. And not coincidentally, the people whose grief does not matter, according to U.S. media and dominant politics, are people whose suffering is caused by the U.S. military. It is hard to believe. I noticed uh, the first chapter of your book, uh, you called it repetition and omission. Explain that. I mean, it, 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 repetition and omission, we do it all over and over again. And, and what are we omitting here? What are we missing here? Yes, in terms of U.S. military invention, intervention, you could say it's sort of a repetition compulsion disorder. <laughs> in terms of propaganda <laughs> messaging, yes. we really know. I mean, how many times, if you watch a lot of TV, do you see a McDonald's commercial? You don't see it once, you don't see it twice. You see it so often. That's because it's well understood that in advertising, in propaganda, 
propaganda requires repetition. Repeating is the essence of propaganda. And when we talk about the bias, the extreme pro-military bias in favor of what Martin Luther King Jr. called the madness of militarism, once in a while, somebody will say, oh, but I read a news article that said something very different. I read a commentary. I heard one somewhere on a radio network, a commercial one. And it did bring up these points that you say are not being brought up sufficiently at all. And my answer to that is, because the essence of propaganda is repetition, the exceptions are, they're exceptional. That does not disrupt the dominant propaganda model. And what we're dealing with now, here we are, the middle of 2023, and it has been so normalized. Healthcare, education, housing, neonatal care, elderly care in the United States, let alone many other countries, lacking basic support. People are dying behind this inequity. And yet, we're told that the Pentagon budget needs to keep rising through the roof. You know, Biden recommended last year he wanted a budget of 800 and something billion dollars just for the Pentagon. That wasn't enough for the bipartisan chairs of the House Armed Services Committees. Even more than that was appropriate. Now, it, it's interesting because you talk about, we talk about repetition and the way that the media gets involved in it. Um, I want to ask a, a rather sinister question. Is the media generally supportive uh, or, or the way they interpret these military actions from the United States as benevolent because they get uh, a, a profit from all these advertisers that we have on TV. Again, you see a lot of Lockheed commercials, Martin Marietta commercials, and all these others on these stations. Do they are they sort of feeding, uh, uh, not wanting to bite the hands that feed them? In effect, it's really multifactorial, and that's definitely one of the factors where you have significant numbers of dollars flowing into major and smaller media outlets advertising from the U.S. military, from military contractors, and so forth. So that's one of the ways in which there's an incentive and a pressure to go along and get along with the militarism of the society. And we have the political pressure, or we have other kinds of commercial pressure. You have ownership with interlocking directorates, people who are on the board of a major uh, military contractor, which includes Silicon Valley, by the way, and they're also on the board of a major TV network or a huge uh, news outlet of some sort. So that, again, is a pressure. And then you have the revolving door that goes around and around between Capitol Hill, the White House, and these military contractors. As a matter of fact, Antony Blinken, uh, he took four years out from government service uh, during the Trump administration, since he's a Democrat. And he made a lot of money uh, brokering military sales to the Pentagon. And so then he had to uh, set aside some of his uh, investments in a blind trust and so forth when he came back into the uh, Biden administration as it, uh, as it took shape. So this is very structural. And in terms of domestic policies, and I know in Politics Done Right, you cover this extensively a big difference between Democrats and Republicans on health care, on education, on civil liberties, on democracy. Of course, we want Democrats to be much stronger uh, for human rights on these issues, often falling short. But let's face it, the Republicans are neo-fascists in mm -hmm. Congress. So that's a big difference in domestic policies. However, once you get to what's been referred to often as beyond the water's edge, there becomes a unity, you might say, an imperial unity, where it's very hard. You know, once you get away from an issue, say, like on climate change, uh, global warming, where there is a difference, but in terms of military expenditures and intervention, Democrats, Republicans on Capitol Hill, it's more like that. They're two peas in a militaristic pot. Let me ask you something about that, Norm, because that is something that we see that, I mean, it's very, very obvious. But is the driving force really that they're together or is the driving force that one party is scared to appear weak and thus they jump on the same bandwagon? Which, which one is it? Well, I think it is a combination. There's a shared belief in that the United States is 
the gift to the world, the extraordinary nation, as it's often called, the indispensable nation. There's a lot of pressure and belief, whatever the internal belief is, and I, I believe it's probably mostly uh, internalized. Democrats and Republicans, they believe that's their role. But uh, there also is that fear you're referring to. And when I was growing up during the escalation of the Vietnam War, one thing that Democrats did not want to be called is soft on communism. Mm -hmm. And then right after 9-11, and for years, Democrats were Republicans, but Democrats felt more defensive about this. They didn't want to be called soft on terrorism. And so that really is another club held over the head of uh, members of Congress, some of whom are very much inclined to want to push back against the militarism. And yet there's a lot of self-restraint that therefore, frankly, often amounts to political cowardice. You know, it's interesting because, I, and, I, and I think one of the reasons books like yours, and not only this book, but all the other books that you put out, informative and so important is that I think a lot of times uh, the ignorance of the American populace is what uh, the, these plutocrats depend on. And then, of course, they puppeteer their, the politicians to do, do their will. But as an example, we, we, we talk about America needs to get uh, tough on China. America needs to get tough on India. How could America possibly get tough? What can America really do if these guys ever just say, no, is military really the answer? Is military just the crap out? Well, there's really almost a nostalgia, which is being outdistanced by the economic realities of the world on Capitol Hill, a nostalgia for a unipolar world. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I remember uh, the, the standard bumper sticker often uh, was red, white, and blue flag on the sticker. And next it would say, these colors don't run. And that's an attitude that we run the world. And of course, the counter bumper sticker also had uh, an American flag, red, white, and blue, and said, these colors don't run the world. But that's a hard one. <laughs> yeah. <for> yeah. The, <laughs> you know, the aspiration is, is still there. And when you step back and you realize that 96% of the human beings on this planet do not live in the United States of America. You see the arrogance involved of empire, not empire building, because the empire of the U.S. has been around for many, many decades, but an effort to retain the empire. And I think part of that explains why the extreme, extreme bias on Capitol Hill and U.S. corporate media and so forth, that does, so to speak, tint the window on the world red, white, and blue. And it then has this, what I call in the book, or made invisible, two tiers of grief. The grief that is part of human experience, and in war, the grief that Americans have suffered or American allies, then that tier of grief is honored as it should be. But the tier of grief, say, of people in Afghanistan or Libya or Iraq who have died because of U.S. military firepower, uh, that tier of grief is, is so discounted that it is tacitly or explicitly through omission or commission of media coverage and political discourse just considered to be incidental, regrettable, but no big deal. Well, that is nationalistic to an extreme. It is often racist, and it's often so culturally centered on our particular way that we happen to live in the United States. I have a chapter in the book called The Color of War. I saw that, and yes. When I stepped back and I thought about it, I was working on this book, often in this room, thinking about it, trying to do more reading and interviewing. And it dawned on me that in two decades of the so-called war on terror after 9-11, virtually 100 percent of those killed by the U.S. military have been people of color. Now, that's hidden in plain sight. Where do we see that even discussed in our U.S. mass media, in the politics? It is like a no-go zone. It's right there. It's like the parable of the emperor's new clothes, that story. Who's going to say it? Who's going to say that out loud so that we can all talk about it? And to be very clear, 
in my book, and this is part of why I called it War Main Invisible, I say very explicitly that we need to understand how this is hidden from us. And yet it's happening. It's right in front of us. So I want to be very explicit about this. The United States government does not bomb countries because people of color live there. But because people of color live there, that makes it politically easier in the United States to have that warfare begin and continue. And what is stunning to me is that we, and this is a good thing, in the last several years, particularly after the Minneapolis police officer murdered George Floyd, we have had more discussion, not enough, but more discussion about structural racism, about systemic racism. But once you get beyond domestic realities, domestic politics and policies, we don't see any discussion of systemic racism in U.S. foreign policy and U.S. warfare. You know, uh, to DeSantis, DeSantis doesn't realize that we have yet to be woke enough. You know, he's concerned yeah. about the woke. Well, put. like we are not near as woke as we really need to be in knowing these particular issues. That's very true and very well put. I, I, I haven't heard it put quite that way before. That should become a national way of discussing what is wrong with these neo-fascists and DeSantis now leading the pack in many ways. It's an attitude that says that we should all go back to sleep. We should all be anesthetized. We should all be numbed when we should all be very callous. It is so inherently a vicious view of how humanity should treat itself. I don't know if you remember during Desert Storm, the way CNN covered it, it looked like a it looked like a a game on TV with lights and it, to, to put it bluntly, it was actually as as you saw it, it was actually pretty as you saw the lights and the flares. And I remember talking to somebody and saying, for every flare that you see, think about the number of people that are dead, the buildings that are falling and breaking skulls, etc. We in the United States, our media, uh, we're not allowed to see the carnage. But in Panama, in Costa Rica, in Dominican Republic, etc., their media actually saw the bones and the, the, the spilled blood and the cracked heads open. We couldn't see that here. So to us, it was a it was a game that was being played. And most of the wars, it, it's amazing in the chapter where, where you talk about the color of war. It's amazing the concern that we had for those in Ukraine and how badly, how cruel it was. When in the Sudan and in many other places, atrocities of that nature, atrocities with our equipment is being done. And it's nothing. It's very much a normalized uh, bias that is so extreme that it fits into what people seem to believe quite often is just just natural. It's I use that cliche, but it's perhaps appropriate. The fish in the water who says, what water? This is the right. baseline 24-7, 365 right. in the media. If we had news media in this country that was truly willing and able to function without fear or favor, then as you refer to, yes, we would have this empathetic coverage of people who are suffering because of this horrible uh, Russian invasion and war on Ukraine. We would also have similar coverage and empathy for people around the world suffering from warfare and especially difficult for any major media outlet to wrap its uh, uh, journalistic mind around is that people who are being killed, and this is still going on, by the way, as my book documents, under the, quote, war on terror subsidized by U.S. taxpayers, those people, if their suffering were being covered with anywhere near the kind of empathy uh, that we're getting for people in Ukraine, in U.S. media, it would cause a tremendous difference in the political atmosphere of this country. Amazing. Now, um, Norman, what would you like, first of all, uh, for those that are listening, these are the types of books that we need to get out there. More of us need to be reading these types of books. 
because we're being stero- we're being anesthetized by the mainstream media. That's what's really occurring here. So uh, I-, I will urge folks to go out and get actually not only this particular book, War Made Easy, uh, War Made Invisible, but also War Made Easy. Remember, we spoke about War Made Easy as well. B- those books should be bought combined. I mean, this new one, of course, but combined, very important. What do you hope? And I don't like to use the word hope. Yeah. So I'm going to change that. What do you want to occur uh, from those reading your books and those talking about your books? What I want for response to the book is very much related to what you just uh, referred to, Alberto, which is that the anesthetic, the anesthetized atmosphere of our society in the United States needs to have a big jolt that sustains us being awake constantly. We've got to be woke. We've got to be waking ourselves up and keeping ourselves awake. Because this stuff is being done in our names with our tax dollars, and what goes around comes around. As uh, Martin Luther King III said a few years into the war on so-called war on terrorism, and I quote this in his book, he said, we all need to be concerned about terrorism, but you don't stop terrorism by terrorizing other people. And that's really a key message of this book. And as you refer to, I had an earlier one called were made easy. And when I thought about writing this new one, it really dawned on me that we have had so much warfare from the U.S. in this country, and more and more it has become invisible. And that's Mm -hmm. why the first three words of the new book I wrote is War Made Invisible, because when we can't see it, this warfare state has more and more power over us. So it's really about getting some acuity, sharing with each other, because Underneath all that, the knowledge is key, and then organizing behind the knowledge for change is absolutely crucial. I know your books can be gotten everywhere, Amazon, everywhere else, but uh, where's your website that uh, folks can not only get your books, but get the commentary and a lot of your, your, your knowledge from? I have an ongoing website, which is normansolomon.com, N-O-R-M-A-N-S-O-L-O-M-O-N.com. And also for this book, there's a lot of background about it uh, on the New Press website. And the New Press is a nonprofit publisher. And if you simply go to the newpress.com uh, and click on the icon with my book cover on it, I was really thrilled to get the kind of uh, endorsement and support for this specific book, or made invisible by Noam Chomsky, by activists, by those who have really been in the forefront of organizing. And as you know, and we've talked about this before, but I, I never feel that it's uh, too much to repeat. This is about learning and action, because the future of our lives and our loved ones really hang in the balance. The name of the book. War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine, a must-get. Norman Solomon, American journalist, activist, media critic, and the co-founder and national coordinator of RootsAction.org. Thank you so kindly for having been once again on Politics Done Right. Thanks so much. I really appreciate our conversation. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.